Hey guys, I'm Sam, and normally this is a YouTube channel where we look at how to build solar-powered charging stations for electric vehicles. But this week I want to switch gears for a minute and take a look at what happened in the state of my home state of Texas last week, which was the complete breakdown of the electric utility grid that left over 14 million people without power during some of the coldest days in the state's history. In this video, I want to try and take a look at how power is generated, transmitted, and sold in the state of Texas. Um, take a look at who's going to take the blame for the collapse of the electric utility grid. Take a look at who's actually to blame. And finally, take a look at what we, as individuals, can do to protect ourselves and our families in the future from being in a situation where it's 15 degrees outside and we have no power. Before we can understand who's responsible for so many people in Texas losing power, we have to understand the, the mechanics and the pieces in the system of how power is generated, transmitted, and sold in the state of Texas. Um, there's really five moving parts to this equation, and I'm gonna describe those to you in a little diorama here. Before I get started, I know I need to hire a graphics person for this channel to do more visually appealing versions of what I'm about to do. Um, hopefully I'll get around to that at some point this year. In the meantime, bear with me. Okay, so here we go. These are our power generators in the state of Texas. Whether they're wind power or coal fired power plant, they are owned by independent companies that are not directly responsible for transmitting power across the grid. Uh, the company that maintains most of the transmission lines in the state of Texas um, power lines, whether they be um, residential lines, commercial lines, giant transformers, most of those across the state are maintained by a company called Encore that does not actually own um, power generation facilities. Encore doesn't own windmills or coal-fired gas plants. They're two separate companies. Now, the consumer, me and you, will be represented by this guy. We don't buy our power directly from Encore and we don't even buy it directly from electricity generators. We have retail providers, I'll see if I can throw a list on up on screen here, who we actually pay for our power, and they in turn buy it from electricity generators, and that's transmitted across the grid. And there's a fourth party, and uh, fifth party actually involved, because there's the consumer, there's the retail provider, there's the transmission line maintainer, and the electricity generators, the people that actually run the power generation facilities, and the fifth party was ERCOT, the Electric Reliability Council of Texas. And I'm going to represent them with this little switch in the diagram. Um, ERCOT makes sure that the power on the grid, the power in these transmission lines, stays within a range at which these, this tra power transmission equipment can handle it. If the power on the grid goes outside of a certain upper or lower threshold that this transmission equipment can handle, you can cause transformers and other very expensive, hard to replace pieces of equipment to fail catastrophically, essentially explode, and then you're stuck having to spend weeks or potentially even months replacing all that equipment, and you can have, and, and you can have a power outage that potentially lasts months. We actually came within minutes of that happening in Texas as the power output from our wind farms and our fossil fuel generators fell off a cliff because that equipment failed under the extreme cold and ice. The power on the grid plummeted and before some of this very time consuming to replace transmission equipment Ex basically exploded or failed catastrophically, melted down, ERCOT threw the switch that killed power to millions of consumers to keep the overall power on the grid from plummeting below that threshold that the transmission equipment could no longer handle. Now, because ERCOT is the one that actually threw the switch, they're the ones that actually said, you 10 million people are not getting power today, they are the ones taking a lot of the heat for everything that happened after that. 
but can we really place the blame on ERCOT? Are all the consequences of having all these people not have power during this extreme cold, can we fairly levy those against ERCOT? Or were these just the poor chumps stuck at the switch when everything went down? Well, in order to understand that fully, let's take a closer look at the company ERCOT. Where do they get their money from? How big are they? And do they actually have the financial and kind of political power to have prevented this situation from happening in the past, or even to prevent it from happening again in the future. Let's take a look at them. In the course of my research on ERCOT, I found a small YouTube channel with some very informative material on the organization. This video on its history talks about how they were founded during the creation of the National Electric Reliability Council, which was created in response to a massive blackout in 1965, the worst in the nation's history at the time. They are managed by the Public Utilities Commission and make their money orchestrating the sale of power from generators to electric retailers. They take a 55 cent cut for every megawatt hour they broker, and that doesn't actually add up to a whole lot. The nonprofit organization has 811 employees and generates about $245 million a year in revenue. $250 million and 811 employees is not a lot to monitor all the power that flows in a state that is bigger than some countries. I think you would find retrofitting the entire state of Texas's power grid to withstand extreme cold would be essentially impossible on such a budget. Some people's response to that has been, well, why didn't ERCOT, you know, bring this potential situation to the attention of Texas legislators? And the Texas legislators could pass a special fundraising tax or something to generate the, geez, who knows, 500 million to a billion dollars that would be necessary to retrofit all of Texas's utility grid. But let's be honest with ourselves. If our legislators came to us and said that we need to pay an additional 500 million to a billion dollars in taxes to protect our power grid from <laughs> the, the kind of cold we probably will never see in our lives, we would have told them, hell no. Use that money to buy schools or, uh, you know, hire more firefighters or fix the roads. Retrofitting the utility grid for a once-in-a-lifetime cold snap would not have been something that the general public would have signed off on, even if ERCOT had gone to the legislators and tried to get them to raise money through us. But nonetheless, ERCOT has emerged in this whole story as the, the scapegoats, and the general public attitude toward them now is pretty much one of... Most of the board of ERCOT has resigned at this point, in spite of having been pretty powerless to prevent this whole thing from happening to begin with. And I would just like to say one more thing to maybe temper the resentment that a lot of people feel toward ERCOT. These switchboard operators do a very, very technical job that probably very, very few people know how to do. And they do it pretty well, as evidenced by the power staying on 99.9% .9 of the time. But they were put in a once-in-a-lifetime situation that they had to make a decision on the fly and either choose between throwing a switch and cutting power to millions of people when it's 15 degrees outside, or leaving that power connected and risking a complete grid collapse that could last for weeks or months. These people probably normally have very boring, mundane, monotonous jobs, and are probably completely unprepared to be placed square in the middle of a crisis like that that was going to have lethal consequences either way. If you're familiar with the trolley problem from ethics, that's literally the situation these people are in. They did not sign up for that kind of responsibility, but that's going to be something that they have to live with for the rest of their life, and I'm sure it's going to be a weight on a lot of them. So maybe cut them a little bit of slack. Okay, sorry to get heavy there. So if it turns out that ERCOT was powerless to prevent this, who's actually at fault? Another thing that people are trying to blame the Texas power outages on is how Texas grid is isolated from the rest of the national grid. Um, if you split the U.S. pretty much right down the middle, uh, you formed the two grids that cover most of the nation, the eastern and the western grid. And the theory is that, well, if Texas's utility grid was connected to one of these other ones that you could, in a bind, kind of source energy from outside the state and alleviate some of the supply problem. 
to me, that argument doesn't hold a whole lot of water because there are plenty of blackouts in places that are attached to the national grid. You don't have to search too hard to find plenty of stories about places that are attached to either the western or the eastern grid also having severe blackouts. So would connecting Texas utility grid to one of these other larger grids help a little bit? Maybe. But is it a fix-all for any future blackouts we might have? No. The final culprit in the blame game is the power generation facilities themselves and why they were not winterized or outfitted to withstand temperatures you know, 20 to 30 degrees lower than the seasonal norm. In Texas, power generation facilities are privatized and largely deregulated. That means that a company can come in and when they build a, a natural gas power plant or a windmill, they get to make the choice whether they are going to winterize that power generation facility. Um, winterizing these facilities can be very expensive. I had trouble finding an exact figure, but I did see the 5 to 10% number tossed around in a few places. So on a windmill that can cost anywhere from 2 to $4 million, well, you might be looking at a $100,000 expense there. Uh, same thing for like a natural gas peaker plant. If you want to insulate those wellheads and build them in such a way where they can still function normally when it's 30 to 40 degrees colder outside normally, this, the expense of doing that is significant. So these companies, when they're having their power generation facilities built, be it wind, natural gas, solar, many of them understandably decide to pass on investing that much money in something that's really going to help them out once every 30, 40, 50 years. And it's hard to fault them for that. If it were us running the company or that was our money being spent on a power generation facility, and they came up to you and said, hey, would you like to you know, equipped your windmill with a um, cold weather package for an extra $70,000, you'd probably say no too. And I think that comes closest to being the actual explanation for why all of this happened, is that we as human beings do not spend large amounts of money and resources preparing for things that we perceive to be very unlikely to happen. We just don't. Ironically, even though the kind of privatization and deregulation, let the free market handle it approach that's been blamed for why a lot of these plants weren't winterized may actually contain within it the solution as well. Because at the height of the crisis, when the grid needed that power the most, um, these power generators, the ones that were still operational, that normally sell one megawatt hour of power for anywhere be between $30 to $100, saw rates spike as high as $9,000 a megawatt hour. So let's do a little bit of math there. That $100,000 cold weather package that we passed on outfitting our windmill with, well, if we had installed that now and that was able to stay operational, many of these windmills can make two megawatts of power. Well, two megawatts in one hour at $9,000 a megawatt hour, that's $18,000 that windmill made you during that power outage when demand was at its peak. Well, now that cold weather package is paying for itself in five or six hours and everything past that is just profit, a lot of profit. And I'll bet you there's gonna be a lot of these power generation operators that go back and look at that and say, maybe that expense that I passed on before isn't such a bad idea. After all, I could have made a lot of money if I was able to supply the grid with power when demand was at its peak. But ultimately, this problem has always been one of engineering and kind of human nature and our tendency to not spend large amounts of resources on things that we perceive to be very unlikely to happen. So if we could just stay focused on that true crux of kind of the problem, the engineering and and maybe kind of reevaluating the amount of resources that we're willing to invest in preventing future crises. If we could just focus on those problems, we could probably keep this from happening again. But unfortunately, a lot of attention was sucked away from focusing on that actual problem by the, I'll say, the media and the political atmosphere in America that tried to paint this really truly engineering problem as some kind of political issue. 
with Republicans saying, oh, it's, you know, it's the windmills and the renewable energy that can't be trusted. You know, those those froze up, even though many of the gas, more gas power plants, I think, froze up. And the Democrats saying, well, you know, it's a Republican run state and they've had control of it for decades now and look at all the problems they're having. Well, that argument doesn't really hold any water either because there's power outages that happen all the time in Democrat managed states as well. And it's all really a distraction from the core issue, which is just how much attention and resources do you invest in protecting yourself from things that are unlikely to happen? So are we going to be able to, as a state, cut through all the noise and decide, okay, we do need to regulate all these power generation facilities and make sure they're all outfitted with the equipment they need to continue to function in weather that's well outside of normal parameters. Um, can we get the state legislature to pass that? If they do pass that, can we get them to find competent inspectors who will come out every year and actually verify this? Um, can we trust that the power generation facilities will get it done in a timely manner? I don't know. That would probably be the ideal outcome of all this. And even if that happens, it's going to have a pretty significant price tag attached to it outfitting all these power generation facilities, not to mention raising the tax to pay for the regulators to go in and do all these investigations every year. Ultimately, the people that are going to be left picking up the bill for all that is, of course, us, the taxpayers. And that just makes the economics behind making and storing your own power at your own house even more rosy. Let's assume, for argument's sake, that the government isn't going to leap into action with an effective well-coordinated plan that they'll execute in a very concise time period and ask in lieu of that what can we as individuals do to protect ourselves from a situation like this happening again why well, for people say that they'll you know make sure that they have a store of firewood in the future but that doesn't really work so well because firewood only lasts a season or two before it starts to decompose your supply of it has to be replenished frequently and after a few years of not needing it you're just going to stop doing it so how about a generator then? Um, generators are definitely a better option than firewood. You've also got to store about, you know, 20 gallons of fuel at all times. And the gas is only good for so long, so your supply of gasoline has to be rotated periodically as well. Um, but the main problem with gas generators is that you have to, well, first off, you're, you're storing it for an emergency, so you're going to want to take it out of the box and make sure the thing works. But then after that, you have, to, you have to meticulously clean it and get all the fuel out of the lines before you can repackage it for storing. And then, you know, take it out of the box again in a year or two, fire it back up so you still know that it works. Um, it's a kind of time-consuming process that's easy to put on the back burner for a long time. And in practice, a lot of people that have these backup generators um, wind up letting them fall into disrepair. And when they need them, they don't work. Which is not to say that a generator is not a better option than nothing. I've delivered a lot of generators in the last week in Dallas, and it's better than nothing. But the problem is that you're not going to regularly use it, and it's just too easy to let something that's only there for emergency uses fall into disrepair when it has as many moving parts as a generator. What would work best for us would really be a solution that would store backup power in an emergency but that we could incorporate into our daily lives in such a way where it would run itself without us having to think with it or mess with it or do a lot of maintenance, but also that we contribute something valuable, maybe power a few appliances um, constantly, passively, so we always know the thing works. The product that kind of best fits this bill, in my opinion, is a home power wall. Basically just a giant battery hooked up to an inverter that will supply the kind of power that you need to run um, refrigerators, any appliance in your house. Ideally, it would be charged by solar, so it kind of the battery would fill itself back up every day without thinking about it. And if you set it like outside in your garage or something, you could hook up a few appliances to it, like the lights in your garage, a little AC unit out there, um, a little fridge in your garage, so that it would contribute some value, some power to you every day. You wouldn't have to mess with it and do a lot of maintenance, and you would always know that it was working because it's always powering something for you even better if you drive an electric vehicle. Then you can use your backup power source that passively charges itself back up off your solar every day to, to charge up your electric vehicle 
at night when you're done driving. And now it contributes, now you've got this backup power source that's contributing a lot of value to you every day by eliminating the expense of charging that vehicle and you get daily confirmation that your generator is working and it'll be there when you need it in an emergency. That's a real home run right there and that's the solution that I'm gonna go after. I'm going to make several videos on this channel over the next year that are all about that build process. Um, I wanna make, make them really beginner friendly so that people without any kind of background in electronics or kind of off-grid power will be able to follow it and build their own. And I'm also going to explain at each stage how you could modify the build to accommodate a whole spectrum of different kind of budgets and power supply needs. Um, from something as small as like the minimum system that you can build with a thousand dollars all the way up to how you could basically modify the system just by adding a few more batteries and build one up to like a $20,000 system that would run your house for a couple of days without power and everything in between. So that people that watch the tutorials can kind of pick out what best fits their budget and what they need. Now I do realize that even a thousand dollar system, which is probably the cheapest you can realistically build one of these for, is out of the reach of a lot of people. That doesn't mean that you're out of luck or you should just sit in your house and freeze if we ever have to suffer through this again. Underneath the kind of quagmire of news stories on the national level that overly politicized the whole thing, there were thousands of stories that were covered in the local news about how many people, individuals and communities, stepped up to help each other out. Um, people donating food, water, taking strangers into their house, even donating generators to power the homes, gas generators to power the homes of people who had emergency medical conditions where they couldn't be without power. I saw a story about a guy who pulled like 140 motorists out of ditches where their cars had slid and they just couldn't get out of there. It was really inspiring to see hundreds and hundreds of stories of people coming through, helping out their neighbors, helping out strangers, um, in situations where they didn't even know how long it was gonna be before they were gonna be able to get running water or power or food again, um, but they still took care of the people around them. Are there some selfish people out there with a almost limitless capacity to turn their backs on human suffering? Yeah, of course, and there always will be. But by and large, people came through to help out other people when this emergency happened. And if you're not in a situation where you can afford to build yourself your own power generation equipment, don't be too embarrassed to ever reach out and ask for help. There are a lot of good people out there who are happy to help. Okay. I'm gonna close out with an economy via the week. I gotta get back to uh, testing all the modules that I'm gonna be using for my home power wall. Um, that's actually what's happening right here. This device right here slowly drains the battery and that determines the capacity of them. You have to know the capacity of all the big batteries in your power wall so that you can make sure all the cells stay balanced. That's one of the technical details that I'm gonna cover in these series of tutorials. So I'm gonna get back to it because as you can see, I got a lot of modules to test. It's gonna be a big battery. Today's Economy V is coming to us from Bertram, Texas. It's a silver 2011 Nissan Leaf with 88,000 miles on it. It got a new battery in 2015, so it still has 10 bars of battery health, which equates to a range of about 60 to 80 miles, depending on the speed that you're driving. The listed price is 4,200, but I contacted the seller and he said he would do an even 4,000 for my viewers. Now underneath the car, there is a battery pack with 48 modules in it. That's these things here. The price of these modules has really been going up lately, with many now selling in the $50 to $70 price range each. There are several reasons for this, including their wide adoption as a stationary power source for a home. That means that this car's battery will be worth $2,500 even after you've used it as a commuter vehicle for a couple of years. So stay tuned for more solar car and EV videos. Thank you guys for watching, and as always an extra thank you to my Patreon sponsors for your support. See you folks again soon.